Well, welcome to yet another inspiring conversation with a very cool leader. My name is Mark Pittman. I'm the author of the new book, The Surprising Gift of Doubt, which is coming out at the time of this recording tomorrow. Um, but people are already showing me pictures of them because they've gotten it early, which is awesome. Uh, rather than refreshing and refreshing and trying to figure out how do I keep, you know, what do I do with myself these days? My wife said, talk to people you admire, talk to leaders and talk about doubt and leadership and uh Charles Johnson, Charles Floyd Johnson, you are one of those people. We've known each other over the years. And uh, really, I'm honored that you'd be here. Thank you so much for, for taking time out of your day. Well, it was nice of you to invite me. I, I thought the book was a very interesting, interesting subject. And since we've been friends for a good, good while, um, I thought, how nice to join Mark Pittman on the day of launching the new book. Well, I don't so know if you I noticed am. that the uh, picture, you there were some headshots you'd sent for a previous thing we worked on, but the picture that I used in that intro was actually uh, when we were together on set of NCIS, uh, oh, the Davenport. I, I wondered where that was from. Okay, I saw that. <laughs> so <laughs> okay. yeah, you were sitting in a chair. It was when all three of us, Chris, myself, and you were being, uh, were, were ta having a conversation, and I just cropped you out of it <laughs> and put that one instead. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I, I actually like the picture, but I didn't know where it's from. Thank you. Oh, you're so, welcome. I'm glad you like going, it. Too. You're asking the question, so I'll let you go. Oh, it's a conversation. You can. I I trust you to ask the questions too. No, I, I was just asking you how it was going so far. Well, so far the day is going incredibly well. The uh, this is my sixth conversation. I, as an extrovert, yeah. I'm totally excited. <laughs> this is more invigorating than ever, right. and the book has gone from. Uh, the 200s in sales down to 49 or 39, I mean, and number four on the top one, uh, top sellers list in this category. So, oh, how great! Congratulations. Thank you. It's exciting. I don't know if it's like watching stats for different episodes, but um, but it's it's yeah. well, it's kind of like watching stats or or waiting for the ratings to come in and uh, kind of figuring out where that was going. So that's that's somewhat analogous. Yeah. Is is Nielsen ratings still the thing, or is it has it diversified? Yeah, still the thing. yeah, you know they're very different now these days, of course, because audiences are so fragmented, and they're, they're watching, you know, with streaming and cable and a network, and so the numbers that we used to get, which were much larger on Nielsen, are probably a lot less now and mean a lot less. But the networks in the, uh, are still using them. Okay. Yeah, I know yeah. we happen to watch on. Uh, I think it's CBS's streaming thing through Prime or yeah. something. That's how we keep up with all the different NCIS episodes. Oh, episodes um, yeah. Yeah. So what, well, one of the things I've, over the years, I put in the intro or in the social media, uh, people may not know, but you've worked on Magnum PI, you've worked on Quantum Leap, you've worked on JAG um, and other, other shows too. You've done um, the, oh, I'm forgetting the movie. Oh, Red Tails. Red Tails, right. Uh, and then also Get in the Way. Um, Get in the way John, uh, the John Lewis documentary, and um, you forgot the Rockford Files, which is where I started. That's right. I knew there was another one, and it's so fun. So you, um, I would love to talk to you about your own leadership, a career, and in, in leadership and doubt. But uh, as we get to, as we get there, part of what fascinates me is uh, doubt is such a part of the human condition. It's such a part yeah. of the leader's journey. It's part of stories. Um, how do you? How have you found over the years making weaving doubt into sometimes episodes and sometimes whole story arcs uh, in ways that don't you don't lose the character? Well, you know, storytelling, as you know, Mark, uh, you know it as well as if not better than I do. Um, you 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 create characters, especially when you're on a series, and then you as producers uh, have the duty uh, to protect those characters. Um, unless, you know, somehow you decide that you want to, to get rid of somebody or someone is leaving and you want to change the arc, whatever. But basically, audiences come to series to uh, for people they like. For instance, mm. Mark Harmon plays Leroy Jeffro Gibbs. And that's a character that's now running in its 18th season. Uh, I think the audiences know that character very well. But We've had many storylines where we've had to figure out how to move that character forward. Uh, and sometimes we're not always sure, this is where doubt comes in, that we're doing the right thing. And, and, and you know, one false move sometimes on a character where audiences love that character 
can be uh, not fatal, but it can it can turn you around the other way, and audiences sort of take a while to come back and trust you because you've done something with the character. So that's where doubt creeps in, and for all of us uh, writers and producers on series, and certainly on NCIS in particular, we have doubt sometimes. I'll give you an example. Yeah. Uh, there was a character, I won't mention which one it was, on NCIS, and one of the writer producers thought he wanted to go a particular way with this character. And I thought, as well as, as some of the other producer and uh, uh, writers that it was the wrong way to go and that if we went the route that this writer who kept saying trust me uh, wanted to go we would destroy the character and we I, I said basically he would not have any credibility with the audience so that's where really doubt creeps in he had no doubt the writer had no doubt no. He kept, I know this is the way to go you trust me I can make it work and I kept saying I don't think so I think you're going to ruin the character, and therefore, so there's where doubt crept in on both sides, at least on our side, not on his as much. In the end, we won out, and we didn't go that route. But that shows you where doubt creeps into your storylines. So, what was and, that like? Was that a tent? It was that a. It seems like it got to a point where it was really probably tense. That conversation. It was very tense. I mean, that I don't. I'm not a yellow or a screamer. Uh, I'm not emotional in terms of dealing with things, but I was behind my desk and he was in front of my desk and I, I was, it was a yelling match because he, wow. he, he was convinced and convicted that he, he knew the way, he knew the way to write the character into this particular uh, storyline and then how to bring him out of it. But I didn't see it. And luckily I, my, a lot of my fellow producers and, and writers agreed. But that's a very good example of where doubt creeps in. But the doubt was on, on our side, not on his. Well, and that's part of um, what I like to write about in this Friends Gift of Doubt is that it's that listening to that doubt of maybe the doubt is unfounded, but maybe there's something, there's some reason why we're having this nudge and maybe we should listen to the doubt. And it sounds like you guys did and saved did. what could have been a travesty. Exactly. And, and I think the thing about uh, what you say in the book is when you have doubt sometimes and you go the wrong way, you, 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 you regret it. But there is that thing where you have doubt whether you can pull something off of the character and it works. And that's where doubt, the surprise of doubt works in the sense that we weren't sure we were going the right way. But in the end, we were just around the corner from making something happen that that audience is really liked. So just out of curiosity, because I'm a geek yeah. about this stuff, what is there some, an example that comes immediately to mind? Or is that just something that happens uh, episodically? I think that just happens. Uh, you know, when, you, when you've been on the air for 18 seasons, which is about 18 seasons, uh, you write a lot of storylines. And we have many characters who are lead characters. And each one of them has an arc. And you have to decide along the way how to get them in and out of that arc. So I would say that's a generic thing. Uh, there, okay. There's probably an example I'm not coming up with. But in the end, um, we've had several cases where we've gone with Gibbs especially, yeah. but sometimes with some McGee, sometimes with Dinozo, where we've pulled them out, uh, gone with a, a thing with its doubt. It was a little risky maybe in terms of trying something that the audiences aren't used to. And then on the other side, Guess what? It worked. It worked, and audiences applauded it. Well, so when, it worked both ways. Bishop is one that comes to my mind is the early, early part where she was married still, and yes. then ended up parting ways, and yeah. she got to be her own character in a different way than I thought she was going to be when she was introduced. And I, you know, and 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 in that pl in that in that particular space, look at the fact that she had a lot of doubt, as did her husband. And yeah. they seem very, very much involved and very much in love. Uh, but they both finally decided it, did, it, it wasn't going to work. Uh, so the doubt worked in both cases on both sides. But in the end, she grew to be a stronger and more, uh, you know, effective character out of that. Yeah. So, you know, it, it turned out to be a good thing. But it wasn't so good. You know, divorce is never good. Right. And uh, and. Uh, and, and, and we had to go down that route and, and we gave the character of Bishop a, a lot of, uh, you know, uh, doubt and a lot of uh, kind of, how do I say it? Uh, 
we'll, I'll get, we'll get into this a little later. But we gave her a, a lot of doubt to examine herself. But in the end, she came out stronger. Ooh, talk to about that because one of the, the themes that's happening in these conversations is the self awareness or reflection, and it yeah. sounds like that's maybe where you're going with this doubt to be. Well, yeah, because I I, I think the bishop character uh, was growing at that point in time, and we had we we realized that she had a lot of growth, and that this particular point in her life and that juncture in her life was one where she had to make a stand and kind of grow and examine herself and uh, and examining herself she came to a truth and the truth was it's i love my husband but it's not working he doesn't think it's working i've got to move on and uh there are many times with that character that's where that worked but there are many times with the character of sloan just recently hmm. who left us and uh, was was felt felt she needed a change, and uh, wasn't sure what that change was, uh, and and uh, there were lots of doubts about it. Gibbs didn't really think she was going to leave, didn't want her to leave, but she felt, even though she wasn't sure about it, that uh, it, it, she had to make a change. And I'm I'm sure there was a lot of doubt and recriminations about that, but in the end, she did, and it was a surprising one, because she ended up saying in Afghanistan not coming back to uh, the States at NCS or not going to Costa Rica. So that we build doubt with all our characters, as you, as you can see. Well, I, what I wonder if we could take it back, because you've since yeah. Rockford files and on, you know, through now um, yeah. you've worked, all these characters are also actors and are people in real life that are playing, right. portraying characters. And it seems to me, and I've been more acutely aware since I've been getting to know you that um, the, you never know if this if the season is going to be renewed or if the series is going to be renewed each year. No, you have no uh, way of knowing that, um, and they don't tell you until as uh, they, they wait until as late as they can to tell you. But involved in that, of course, is a lot of contracts sometimes come up. Okay, and the negotiations have to go on, so <laughs> they have to kind of figure out who's on board, uh, who's staying, who's not going. And so some of that is, you know, just a matter of the natural course of business. Uh, and CBS doesn't like a network we're on doesn't like to announce their um, uh, renewals until they have a good chunk of them. Because if they announce too early with one show, then the others going away. Well, what about us? Oh, so CBS, right. often, yeah, CBS often waits and announces, and, and a couple of the other networks are doing that too. But we don't know, and so there is doubt there as to whether you're not whether you're coming back the next season. <laughs> so, how do you help? Um, how do you how are there ways that you've learned as you've worked with teams, production teams? One of the things that impressed me about being on set pre-pandemic was right. the huge numbers of people that yeah. it takes to uh, put go into an episode. So you're not just working with the people we see on screen, but you're working with the camera crews and the costume and um, catering. The, the- the catering, the property, the stunts, special effects. Oh, true. Uh, you know, uh, art department, production department. You, you're just working with so many, so many different units, and then you've got all the post production that you know people don't even see. Where you've got, you know, you 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 you've got the composer, and you've got the people over all the uh, the looping and the and the and the sound effects, and then the dubbing that goes on the stage. And there's a whole slew of people. Well, when we were there, it was the hand people. Like, they're people that looked like the main characters, but they didn't quite look right. And I guess they were the hand people. So when they're showing the phone, it's somebody else. We uh, we do. We have an insert department and there are. And we and we and we audition people to get their hands to look as close to the like the people that they are doing the thing. So we have a whole group of people who are just hand people who do that. It was it was really funny because I thought, are they like Hoovians? Like they're dressed up like the doctor, but they're dressed up like NCIS characters. And then I really, then I think you told me that it was the inserts. That's that's inserts, great. Inserts, yeah. So, oh yeah, wh- and you have to be close to what the actors' hands look like. Well, because yeah, people so you, are watching. Yeah, I, I, I've had complaints from a couple of actors that you're using somebody who their hands don't look like mine, and then you have to go search. <laughs> 
Oh it's my true. goodness! And I, I would have thought it was the fans because it's such there's such a deep fan base for well, something the, like the that. But fans, well, fans catch so many things that you don't even think they're going to catch. But sometimes the the actors, uh, you know, look at that and go, "That doesn't look like my hand," and and that's not very honest. So you know that that's it. But we just we have we have close to 250, 300 people who who have to do the show. Wow! When we move. Um, uh, from one location to the next, it's it's like a traveling circus. It I really is. Bet. Oh my goodness! Yeah. yeah, we were just in the the studios, and we weren't even on You're locations. Wow! And it's more expensive. I, we don't need to spend time on that, but it's more expensive when you have to travel because you know you have a lot of drivers, you have uh, you know uh, uh, locations that you have to pay for. Hours are longer because the drivers have to start early and the drivers have to stay later after they bring everybody back. So going on location is a much more expensive thing. But it's 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 I bring that up only to say it's a there are a huge amount of people, not just in NCIS, but in most television shows you see uh, it takes yeah. a village. So this is uh, this may be an inter the I remember hearing you talk about Jag and how the first season was somebody else doing it. And it was yeah. all on location. And one of the changes you brought to Jag when when it became more um, became the show that most people will know it as it was. You said that you were you brought it to a standing to sets to set locations yeah. or more. Um, it, Jag the first year was on NBC and it was it was an action adventure. And Harm Harmon Rab was uh, a uh, lawyer, but he was a pilot. And they concentrated much of the first season at NBC on on uh, adventures but not in the courtroom. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the ratings weren't as good on NBC and they canceled it. And then uh, CBS decided to pick it up uh, for its second season. And it was decided at CBS that they wanted to be a, a, a more of a legal show. And I had worked, I don't know if I ever told you this, but when I was in the military, I, I, was, I had graduated from law school, but I hadn't passed the bar. And I got assigned to a, a division of the staff judge advocate's office in the army hmm. and they assigned me to something called the courts and boards division, which handles special and summary court marshals. So I had had that experience wow. running a courts and boards division uh, and, and with cases with uh, judges who were the officers and lawyers who were my friends uh, that I assigned cases. So when I went into JAG, I knew what a courts and boards division looked like and a whole office structure. So I talked to Don Belisario about that and said the way to do this is to start using permanent sets, which they didn't have, um, and uh, they had one or two that they put up and down, and to use an office structure. And because I had worked in one and run one, I knew how that was, and we got the art department and the production designers, and that's that's how we came. And we were man we managed to make it into a legal show and to save money. Right. Well, Once you have the permanent sets, you use those. And I think it's, it's, I don't know if this is true, but it seems like it's somewhat comforting for the viewer to know what there's, there's some similarity. There's some semblance. Oh yeah. I recognize this place. Uh, yes, there is some comfort, but you know, shows take on different, uh, different things. Quantum Leap didn't hardly ever had a That's permanent true. set. They had the accelerator and a couple of other things, but basically every week it was a, it was a new adventure, yeah. but that the audience accepted that as sure. that. He was he was you know seeking to come home again, and he was uh, you know finding these adventures. So, in that sense, the comfort of having the you know what what the s surroundings look like it wasn't important. It was much more the adventure with Quantum Leap. Okay, yeah, that's a very good point because that was yeah. different every time. the The characters through line like that overarching story, but it allowed for a lot of flexibility. In the oh yeah, oh yeah. And the last year of that show, which is one I did. Uh, Don decided to to have him leap into some uh, real characters. So he le he leaped into Lee Harvey Oswald. Yep. He leaped into Elvis, and a couple of others. Yeah. So what an interesting yeah, title. Interesting. Uh, I I want to segue into one thing that uh, we, talk, we talked about, and that is doubt for your your personal self yeah. as you move through your career, and. Uh, yeah. I think I've always been plagued with doubt about how successful I, I can be when I go into a project. Every project I've gone into, every project I've gone into, I've gone into with a certain fear, a certain fear and a certain doubt, can I do this job? Wow. 
and 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 this is over now a 40 or 50 year career as you know but there's a there's a thing in the in the theater business where uh actors joke they're going to find me out for the fraud i am and and i think that plagues us a, a lot of times so uh i went into when i went to do magnum pi in the 80s uh, I had been a producer on a lot at Universal where I had been on the lot with a group of people who I worked with every day. Hmm. And suddenly I was thrust into going on location to be a producer, which I had never done. Wow. In, in Hawaii with the locals, which, uh, you know, uh, Hawaiian culture is what it is. It's very different. You have to learn it. And then I had to be uh, the, and I was the only major producer who dealt with, uh, the cast and the crew and the locals. And I also didn't know Hawaii. And I had to learn that fast. I mean, I had been there on vacation maybe once or twice, but I didn't know it. And, I, and so I thought, I'm never going to be able to do this job. And they're going to they're gonna fire me, you know, two, three months into it. But I, but I ended up doing it for six years and learning. And, and so the doubt that I had went away. And some of it went away, Mark, because as you grow, you then turn that doubt into something very positive. Yeah. And, and, you, and, and, and that's, that's, that's has, has, has been through my entire life. And I've had a great deal of serendipity in my life. And, uh, and, and, and that serendipity often thrusts you into a new kind of uh, job or a new kind of venue and you have to then go, I can do this. But, uh, you know, that's where you take doubt and turn it into a positive. So are there ways that you've known, because you say you've had a great deal, deal of serendipity, but I hear you also, um, it's not like you're passively letting stuff happen. You're actively going into places where you don't know if you, you're not really convinced that you have what it takes. So how Well, I go, go ahead. I'm sorry. You no, go for it. I just, how do you know, like, have you developed some tells over the years where you realize... This is this is a this is serendipity that I want to lean into, and this is serendipity I want to pull back from. Well, serendipity comes in so many forms. It comes in the fact that you you end up sometimes meeting people and networking. You get mentors and colleagues who see your potential and want to help you. And in that sense, you then lean into that because you 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 find a kind of a synergy that's mm -hmm. there, and you and and I think that synergy has helped me to stay on shows. I mean, you remember I've had long runs. Yeah. I had, I had six years on Rockford, six years on Magnum, nine years on Jag and 18 years on NCIS. Uh, you don't do that without forming some kind of synergy and without getting some kind of a, a tell as to when things are working and when they're not. And uh, synergy also about being in the right place in the right time synergy. And that's serendipitous, but also you, you lean into that, because you suddenly realize, I'm I'm here. I can use this, and then the serendipity that comes with the fact that you're in the job, and you also realize that you can pair that with hard work and preparation. Mm. Well, and I love too that there's a you. I think one of the things I think doubt helps us do is figure out who we are better, and yeah. so as we start operating in auth authenticity. We start growing that confidence back up of this is weird, this is different, but I think I can do it. And I love that you are in the judge advocates corps that we said with the army. Well, it was it was the staff judge advocate. Judge advocate uh, general is the navy and the marines. Okay. The army is the same thing, but it's it's the SJA staff judge advocate. Staff yeah. judge advocate. It just isn't so cool to me that you went from. Uh, law school without taking the bar and then to this this office that then years later became something that really helped you with a long run well, TV. I mean, that's that's one of those the, the, what are the chances right you, i had no idea that you know uh that later on that this would come into play later on of course i took the bar when i went to dc to work for a little while and passed the bar but i didn't i wasn't a member of the bar when i was in the military uh, and the interesting thing about that job, one last thing about that, was when I was in that role, I couldn't be an officer because you have to be, I had to either do four years and commit to it, and I only wanted to do two, uh, or I had to take the bar and become, uh, hmm. a, a, you know, a, a, a lieutenant. But that would have also made another two years added to my time. But uh, I used that 
as a way of uh, growing in that job. And I was what I was what, what I was called at that time in the military was a specialist fifth class. But this is the, this is the kicker that you should know. The UCMJ, the Uniform Code of Military Justice, okay. allows you to be a defense counsel, even if you're not a lawyer. If a, if a client wants you to be his lawyer, you can do it. You so use that happened, in the show. Yes. So what happened? I remember that. So what happened for me in the military was there was during the Vietnam War, there were so many young men who were getting in trouble, especially going AWOL in the New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania, Delaware area, that we had so many cases and we had a backlog in the in the um, in the stockades. And my lawyer friends who were lieutenants and captains said to me, you have to help us with this caseload. So I went with them to the stockades and I and and they presented me. And several young men chose me to be their lawyer. I went back and started defending. I couldn't prosecute, but I defending the cases. I won a lot of the cases, got a reputation. I defended 325 or something like that court marshals, courts marshals, and ended up with an army commendation medal for doing that. Oh my God! That, that was amazing. Just amazing. <laughs> You're so talented. That is really cool. That's well, great. You, I, and I listen. And the, the first time I did it, I wasn't sure, but I had been through law school, and I, you know, I'd been through moot court, so I wasn't totally unprepared. But you know, to end up doing 325 cases in uh, uh, about uh, 18 months was amazing. That is really, really cool, yeah. Charles. I really appreciate your taking the time to celebrate on this day. I want to honor your time because I know you have a lot to get back to. Yeah. If there's one thing um, that you would. Uh, piece of wisdom, piece of advice you'd give to leaders and emerging leaders that are watching this, what would it be? Well, that m most of the time when you're in your chosen field and it's something that's working, um, it, there there's always going to be a question of how you can achieve things, how you can make things better. And there is always, there's never a certainty about any of that. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think most leaders know that. But the one thing that I would say, and that's why I like uh, this, uh, this, this book that you've done, is that you take that uncertainty, you take that possible frustration about doubt and turn it into something that uh, ultimately on the other side of the equation when you've got it done, turns into a, a positive feature and one that you know you can learn by and that other people can follow and learn by what you've learned. That would be my thought. Love that so much. Charles, thank oh. you so much. Thank Appreciate you, and this. congratulations again. I, I'll keep looking for uh, 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 the surprise of da the gift of doubt on the, on, the, on the bestseller list, and good luck with it all, and good luck in everything else you do, Mark. Well, thank you so much. When the pandemic's over, hopefully we can come over and visit. Yeah. It's nice to be your friend. Take it's, care. Likewise. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye.